Chapter 20 Here We Have Hope Three more explosions shook the surrounding area before Onion and I made our way down the side of the collapsed building. Gunfire filled the distance in bursts, at times leaving a quiet wake behind them. A few times I thought that maybe it was over, that whoever was protecting Hope had beaten back their aggressors. But every time the gunfire picked up again. I do hope you have a plan, miss. Is it a well-thought-out plan? No. No, it's not. Didn't we already have a discussion about going into situations unprepared, miss? Relax, Onion. I'll think of something once we get closer. The truth of the matter is I had no plan. There were too many variables present, all of them unknown. In my mind I pictured some poorly maintained militia trying to defend their home from a large group of raiders. Knowing who the enemy was made it easier. But it could be the other way around. Maybe some of the thugs had already captured Hope, and this external force was simply its citizens trying to take it back. Or even worse, Hope was already run by bastards, and another group of bastards is trying to take it over. I could sneak up through the back, get onto the roof, or simply perform a frontal assault. But no matter what I did, I didn't know who the enemies were. I checked my sensors, but we were still too far away to pick up anything. And the cover was decreasing exponentially as we got closer to the town. From the back of the building, it looked as if they kept it in pretty good shape. A few patches here and there, but otherwise it was a very stable structure. That means the attack must have just recently started. Minus the rails, the entire area in front of my side of the structure was flat. I couldn't tell if it was another park or if at one point the previous structures were simply destroyed in the war. That's when I noticed something glimmering in the distance. While it was still cloudy, occasionally a burst of sunlight breaks through for a moment. And this one just happened to cast itself on what looked like... water. Onion! I think there's still water over there. I knew that something as minuscule as water shouldn't have distracted me so easily. But it was the first sign of water I'd seen since leaving the burrow that didn't belong to some thugs. I was starting to get low on water and hoping to find some in hope. But if I can get some for free, all the better. We kept under one of the larger tracks, using its shadows to hide our presence. Just because I couldn't see anyone didn't mean that no one could see me. Since we left the city streets, the number of obstacles such as cars and debris had dwindled dramatically making our movements much more fluid instead of having to consistently watch my steps. Onion simply drifted over all the obstacles with ease, making me think that maybe I should have built a much larger robot that could have chauffeured me around. Of course, the thought never occurred to me in the burrow, where everything was a ten minute or less walk away from any point. I wonder if you would object to me adding some wheels. An explosion made me remember why I was sneaking around in the first place. Smoke continuously billowed out from the other side of the structure. As I got closer, I started to realize how big it was. According to Onion's pre-war maps, this was once a transportation hub that connected trains and their passengers throughout the different districts and to the boroughs beyond the city limits. With its size, it must have been able to accommodate hundreds of mammals of all shapes and species. No wonder this place turned into a town. My thoughts were distracted once again as I reached the closest pool of water. Miss, my radiation detectors are going crazy. Damn it. This water's not drinkable. I looked at my radiation detector and saw its count ticking between 10 rads a second and 16 rads a second. These weren't lethal numbers, but with that many ticks a second, it would build up quickly into something much more potent. The last thing I need is radiation poisoning. Especially after those Steel Guardians patched me up from all the radiation I'd been exposed to since leaving the burrow. The pool was rather large and it was murky so I couldn't see the bottom. So swimming through it would be out of the question. And the only thing connecting this side of the pool to the other side were these rails. Unless I wanted to go all the way around. In which case I'm sure someone would spot us. Gunfire told me that I needed to make a decision. And fast. I may have an idea, miss. And what's that, Onion? 
I performed scans of the railway structure above us, and I noticed that some of the support beams were in dire need of repair. I don't think anyone would care if it fell, Onion, with no trains and all. There might not be any trains for support, miss, but my calculations show that if we weaken this pillar further, the entire structure will collapse into the pond and potentially make a bridge for us to use. That's... actually a good idea. However, we would need a decent-sized explosion, and that might grab the wrong attention. I had one grenade left, but I'm not sure if I'm going to need it. I've learned that simply having a grenade is a weapon enough, but I needed a small explosion. One that... oh yeah. I dropped my bag and went through it until I found what I was looking for. Back when I rescued Bo and his family, I kept the two collars that I took off them. I had used one on that damn glowing ghoul, but I remembered I still had the other. I pulled it out and walked over to the support beam Onion was talking about. Sure enough, it had cracks all throughout it, and rebar was sticking out of the concrete in places. It's a good thing there weren't any trains anymore, otherwise this would have been an issue crossing. I was simply going to put the collar beneath the pillar, but I could tell that the explosion would not be large enough to cause the complete structural failure. I need to get the explosive inside the pillar somehow. Then I began to wonder how this thing worked. I sat down, pulled out my tools, and started looking for an access panel. Miss, what are you doing? From what Bo told me about these collars, they have a very small explosive charge in them that pretty much keeps the blast radius around the neck of its victim. If I could figure out how to extract the explosive component from the collar, it would be small enough to shove into the cracks of the support allowing me to create an explosion from the inside out. Didn't he also say that they can explode when tampered with, miss? Well, yeah, but I already made sure the trigger mechanism was disarmed. If you are so worried, why don't you do it? I extended the collar and the tools out to Onion, but he drifted backwards a few inches. No, thank you, miss. I have already experienced enough explosions as it is. I chuckled as I continued my work on the collar. Things did tend to get messy around me, and explosions are typically the messiest thing. I managed to pop off the back of the collar, paying attention to the lights on it, making sure that I didn't do something to accidentally turn it back on. Inside was a small plastic sheath that covered everything. Peeling it back revealed the inner workings. A small computer chip that I figured was the wireless detonator connected via two small wires to a small yellow square of what looked like clay. I went to remove the wires when the light suddenly turned on and started to flash. Well, fuck. I went to activate my pit board, but just as I took my paws off the wires, the flashing stopped and the light died out. From the look of it, if I tried to remove the wires, it would detonate. From what I knew, the clay must have been some type of plastic explosive. And the two wires were creating a circuit through it. If the circuit was broken, boom. I tried to remove the detonator, but once again the light started flashing as I tried to remove the wires connecting it to the collar housing. This was going to take all my effort to figure it out. What I should be doing is coming up with a plan B. But complex problems like this always seem to garner my attention more. There's something I'm missing. I opened up the knife blade from my multi-tool and slowly slid it underneath the explosive. That didn't trigger anything. So, being very careful... I lifted it up. Well, I thought so. There was a third wire connected to the yellow component. That's how it worked. In order to detonate it, it needed an electric charge to initiate the detonation, but it also needed a backup to prevent tampering. It would take a considerable shock to create the explosion. But the two wires on top must be constantly sending a weak signal, using the explosive as a carrier. If one of the wires were to be cut, it would create a feedback loop through the other two, causing the detonator to trigger. If this was going to succeed, I would have to trick the detonator into thinking the circuit was still complete, as I completely removed the explosive. I took my knife and carefully scraped away the plastic housing on top of the two wires, exposing them. Testing my idea, I placed the backside of my knife across the exposed wires, creating a bridge between them. No light. I grabbed a small scrap electronic that I had in my bag and ripped off two wires from it, stripping the ends of each along with the middle of one of them. 
I wrapped one of them in the middle, creating a T-shape. I curved the other ends and gently placed them down so that the wires made contact with the other two simultaneously. Once I was sure there was no signal to the detonator, I wrapped the ends of the wires. Now I just need to take care of that third wire. I carefully lifted up the explosive again, using my screwdriver to prop it up enough to reach the last wire. Scraping off the covering was much more difficult. I had made sure that the explosive wire on top didn't come into contact with anything else, or else risk breaking the circuit. Once I had all the wires attached, I started to slowly pull out the ends that were embedded into the clay. Unlike before, there was no light. I managed to create a backup circuit so that, even if I removed the explosive from it, it wouldn't trigger the detonator. Once the explosive was freed from the casing, I proceeded to shape the square into something more useful. I was able to thin it down into a rope-like shape which allowed me to push it deep enough into the cracks. Now I just need to detonate it. The obvious choice was to use the detonator that was left in the collar. I had basically rewired the entire thing to get the explosive out in order to plant it inside the crack on the pillar. It would be tricky to reuse the detonator without accidentally having it go off in my face, especially with how short the wiring was. I didn't have anything longer, but the lack of materials rarely ever stopped me. To start with, I attempted prying out the module that connected the electronics to the power source. All I need was to remotely activate the detonator. All this extra failsafe and anti-tampering stuff was pointless. With no threat of sudden death, the process was much smoother. It only took me a few minutes to separate the necessary parts, and I put the rest back in my bag. A bombless collar probably has no use to anyone, but my mom always did say I was a scrap hoarder. Wiring the explosive was similarly easy, although I had to be careful not to touch the two strip wires together. I had no tape, so I did my best to keep them on the opposite sides. Once I was happy with my work, I retreated to a safe distance and booted up my remote function. Since I had previously contacted my pit board at the collar, its signal was still in the database. Since there was no way to test my work, I simply had to hope for the best. Okay, Onion, take cover. There wasn't much cover to be had around us, so we simply moved as far away as the signal would allow. I hid behind some sturdy-looking pillars on the adjacent track. I used my scope to make sure the coast was clear and that no one had seen us. I realized that I not heard the sound of explosives or gunfire for the entire time I was here. Surely it took me about 15 minutes or so. But the sudden eerie quiet started to worry me. There was nothing I could do until I got past this rad-filled water. So I did the only thing I could do. I pushed a button. I covered my ears with my paws, not sure what to expect. But it turns out it was all for nothing. There was no boom, flash, or any other signs of an explosion. I looked at my pit board to verify it was still connected and pushed the button again. Still nothing. Was there a delay in the signal? I never had this issue before. I waited a moment before I got up to investigate. Hmm. You think the caller was a dud? I'm not sure. I do detect trace amounts of explosives. Is it possible the connection shorted out? Or did you not secure the wires properly? I started walking towards the pillar. Are you saying it's my fault? When it comes to electronics, I am... As I got closer to the pillar, the explosive finally detonated. Thankfully, I was far enough away not to get hit by flying debris. But I was close enough for the shockwave to knock me on my ass. Why is it I always end up on my rear or my face? Elevated heart rate detected. Potential threat found. Activate bats. Oh, shut up already. There was quite a bit of smoke from the explosion that spread both up and out. It was hard to make out if it had worked until I heard a creaking noise, followed by a loud splash. My rad detector clicked a few times as the water splashed near me. But it was well within safe limits. The smoke finally cleared enough for me to see that the plan had worked. The entire bridge structure was lying in the water. Although a section of it had dipped below the surface. It was a short enough distance though that I'd be able to make the jump with relative ease. The tracks collapsed sideways, giving me a good area to boost myself up from the stub that once was a support beam. I turned to make sure Onion was ready when I heard something land a few feet away from me. Was it some debris? I took a look at it and saw a flashing light. Oh, fuck me. I managed to get away just as the grenade exploded. 
The explosion knocked me against the downed pillar, but it didn't cause me any injuries. Who the fuck was launching grenades at me? I saw my scope on the ground. I must have dropped it when the first explosion knocked me down. I surveyed the area. There was no sign of any mammals until I saw a small flash come from on top of the roof of the town. A few seconds later I was greeted by another grenade. But since I was no longer off guard I was able to dodge this one easily. Fuck! Someone's targeted us with a grenade launcher. I switched to another screen on my pit bore. And they're too far away for me to pick them up. What should we do, miss? Well, even if I had a long-range weapon, I have no idea if it's a friend or foe attacking us. So I'd rather not retaliate until we have a better understanding of the situation. I hope you have a plan, miss. Well, I do. You're not going to like it, though. You better not. Onion cut off as a grenade landed uncomfortably close to him. I looked towards the pillar. Run. I bolted towards the pillar with Onion in tow. The third grenade exploded. But I was already in the middle of landing on the length of track leading us across the irradiated waters. I kept my eyes on where the grenadier was and noticed that it took a few seconds between shots. So either they were a horrible aim, or it was a single fire weapon. Another flash announced the immediate arrival of a grenade, but this one landed in the water. The explosion was much smaller, with the water absorbing much of the blast. But it did create a fountain of water that caused my radiation detector to go nuts for a second. I reached the gap, and without thinking or stopping, I squatted down and pushed myself up into the air. At the same time, I saw a flash from the roof. The attacker must be getting better with their aim. Because right near the apex of my jump, I felt the grenade fly past me. I looked back to make sure Onion was okay, and saw him floating only a few feet from me. I had about 10 or 15 feet left before I cleared the water, so I forced my legs to move faster. The unknown assailant got one more grenade in before I was able to finish crossing the pools. Once I was on a much more stable surface, I booked it to the building's wall. Either the grenadier ran out of ammunition, or they lost line of sight on me because there was no more signs of aggression. I looked up, but I couldn't see anything other than wood and metal that formed a patchwork wall. I took a moment to catch my breath as I tried to find some signs of an entrance. But this entire area was solid. They probably only wanted one single entryway, and that must be the one currently under attack. To both the left and the right of me were some kind of balcony that extended slightly away from the building itself. From the layout of the four tracks that connected to this side, it looked as if the middle area was designed for a much larger train rather than the other two, since the tracks that dead-ended in the patchwork walls were much narrower. Either direction looked about the same. I started to move around the left side of the building. The pool of water reached around the side, with the balcony overhanging it. I needed to get on top of that outcropping to continue around the building, but it was much too high for me to jump straight up. Thankfully, the edge of the pool increased in height to the point where I should be able to climb onto the balcony with little difficulty. Once I got on top, I needed to move carefully and try to identify the situation before I acted. With a semblance of a plan, I started to work. The anxiety was building the entire time. My mind drifted towards the fact that I had not heard any gunfire or explosions, save for the unknown assailant. So I had no idea of the current state of affairs. Did the attackers win, or did the defenders? I was still no closer to even knowing who was the actual enemy, and until I did I was going to refrain from violence. If I ended up attacking someone from Hope, that would end any chance of me gaining entry. I climbed onto the edge of the pool, being careful that I didn't slip and fall in, and found that the concrete forming the structure's walls had been fractured enough to give me some good grip holds once I was on the balcony. Now that I was able to catch my breath, I noticed that between the patchwork, much of the stone structure had large faults in them. I wonder if those quakes had reached all the way out here as well. I got to the top without incident, although I had been concentrating so much on not being seen that my grip almost slipped, which would have caused a rather unwelcome plunge into the waters below. There were still no signs of any mammals, so I continued my slow approach on the other side. I peeked around the first corner, but... All I saw was a small alcove, so it left it much darker than the surrounding area. I was about to glance past the second corner when I heard voices. Weirdness, ceasefire is driving me crazy. 
I joined up to kill and loot, not sit around babysitting some crappy pre-war mechanical something or other. The boss has his reasons, no matter how crazy they are. I'm guessing he's thinking he can find some more of these things. They'll help us take over the whole city. How can a hunk of junk do something when no single mammal's been able to make claim to it? Don't know. But once he got his mind to something, you may as well follow along. Remember what happened to Sammy? No, don't remind me. I'm glad that phase is over with. I may enjoy killing, but cannibalism, that's where I draw the line. Let's just see what's up with the boom show back here so we can head back to the camp before all the action starts up again. The voices were getting closer. From the sound of it, I knew they were bad guys. I don't enjoy killing, but it's been an often and necessary evil. Once you start to enjoy it is when your mammality begins to fade. I always need to remember what side of the line I'm on, even if both sides are gray. I pressed myself close to the wall as possible, trying to hide in the shadows. I signaled the Onion to power down his levitation unit to avoid any unwanted attention. I pulled out my gun and held it at the ready. There were only two of them, but if I wasn't careful that number may increase exponentially. I heard the noises of walking as they neared the alcove I was in. They were light, making small tapping noises with each stride. This meant that they were some smaller species, but I had no idea what they were. My curiosity was answered when I watched two rams turn the corner. They were polar opposites from each other physically. One had a large fluffy wool coat that his armor was barely keeping in check, while the other was scrawny with small white puffs sticking out from legs and arms. They both wore similar looking outfits. Worn down cloth jumpsuits with metal plates across the chest. The larger one had a very big hammer, while the other one had some kind of assault rifle. I looked at Onion and nodded. What the? They were too busy talking amongst each other that they didn't notice me and Onion lunge at them. I punched the smaller one square in the face while I heard a cracking sound as Onion's stun baton went to work on the larger one. My target was so caught off guard that he dropped his rifle and I scooped it up and pointed it at him. Although for its size, it was probably obvious that I had difficulty keeping it level. I glanced over and saw the other ram convulsing on the ground. That metal armor must have helped amplify Onion's already strong shocks. Make any sudden moves, and I will reply with a bullet to the brain. Got it? Uh, uh. I'll be the one doing the talking. Who are you? And why are you attacking Hope? I heard coughing as I saw the larger ram's mouth begin to foam up. I figured the ram in front of me would be cowering in his armor at what we had just done to both of them. But I was so caught off guard when he started to laugh. <laughs> you fucking idiot. Do you realize what you're dealing with here? Um, some murderous thugs? <laughs> you wrong, cunt. We the berserk kings. And you've gone and made my friend here very angry. The ram that was seconds ago convulsing on the ground was now standing. The veins in his neck were bulging and I could see a fiery rage in his eyes. He was big before, but his presence felt much larger now. His mouth was still foaming as he picked up his hammer and swung it at me. I jumped away just as it slammed into the ground, shattering it and leaving a very large crater. Well, this is not good. Onion was trying to electrocute him again, but it didn't seem to phase him. His focus was on me and me alone. What the fuck? I wasn't even the one who heard him in the first place. I still had the gun, but its size and weight were making it harder for me to dodge the incoming attacks. He swung again, this time the side of the hammer embedding itself in the building's wall. I pointed the rifle at the ram and went to fire it when I felt something hit my back, knocking me to the ground. Onion rolled past me as I struggled to get up, and I felt a hoof land on my back, forcing my face into the pavement. Out of the corner of my eye I saw the larger ram finally free his hammer from the wall. Oh, I was in trouble. Imminent threat detected. Activate bats. Oh, finally. Yes. It had been a while since I had used bats, so my skin jumped at the feeling of the needle inject the chemicals into my arm. 
I felt my reaction time get better, and my heartbeat normalize, and the world around me started to slow. I wasn't sure if this was an addictive substance, but I felt at home under these conditions. It felt good. The ram on top of me was reaching down to pick up his gun as I twisted my body and kicked his leg, causing him to tumble. Once I was free from his hoof, I rolled out of the way as the hammer came smashing down. I don't know if things happened too quick or if he simply was too drugged up to care, but he continued his full swing, crushing the skull of the smaller ram. The chemicals were going to wear off, so I only had one shot before I needed to take cover. I considered grabbing the rifle, but I doubt I'd be able to ready it fast enough as the ram was already lifting his weapon into another full swing. For a big guy, he moved rather fast. I decided upon my handgun before realizing I didn't have it. Fuck! I must have dropped it in the scuffle. I looked around for it as the chemicals started to wear off. Not wanting to meet the same fate as the deceased mammal, I jumped out of striking range of the melee weapon. And that's when I saw my gun was right next to him. Well, that fucking figures. I doubt I could keep this up much longer. I narrowly escaped being hit again, and that's when I heard something land between me and the rampaging ram. I knew that sound, and I knew that flashing light. It was the same type of grenade I had been dodging earlier. I jumped out of the way as it detonated, the ram taking the full force. While I didn't take any damage from it, it forced me to the ground, landing on my back for once. I heard a loud thump as I saw the ram collapse. The explosion had also sent my gun in my direction, coming to a stop near my leg. Chalk that one up to fate, I guess. I was already feeling tired, and I didn't even know if that grenade was meant for me or both of us. I plopped my head to the ground and sighed. Movement caught my eye as I looked in the direction, and my heart stopped. This fight made me forget why I was trying to be cautious in the first place. I landed in a manner that caused me to see a good chunk of the other side of the building. Standing there, in a huge mass were dozens of mammals, big and small, and they all had their attention on me. Every one of them dressed in a similar garb as the two rams. I should have been concerned with the sheer size of the force, but the only thing that had my attention was in the middle of this mass. I was in awe. Bigger than any mammal I had seen so far stood a monstrous piece of machinery. With a domed head on top of its enormous frame, it was the largest and most intimidating robot I had ever seen. The sun glistened off a reddish-brown plating as it spun in my direction. The crowd parted as I saw the three-wheeled legs that supported it start to move. The entire thing was now oriented towards me. Red lights began to glow behind the caged faceplate on its head as it lifted its two arms in my direction. A voice boomed out from the robot, snapping me back into the moment. Looks like we found the source of the ruckus, boys. Time for some fun.